Welcome and good evening. Uh, welcome to the uh, July 9, 2018 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Shall we please pledge allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would you please have the roll call? Chairman Sullivan? Here. Councillor Garvin? Here. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Here. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Councillor Sarah Lennon? Here. Councillor Valerie Randall? Here. Councillor Christopher Straw? Here. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Penny Jordan had a conflict this evening and will not, not be attending. Um, and I would like to, before I ask for other town council reports and correspondence, I'd like to thank our town clerk, Deb Lane, and all the election officials that conducted our elections on June 12, which were uh, went on into the wee hours, I understand. We did. And uh, we had quite a voter turnout. And with uh, all the changes in the election process this year, it was a very long night. So we want to thank everybody for all their hard work. Thank you. Are there any uh, town council reports and correspondence? Councilor Lennon? I just wanted to quickly report on the comprehensive plan. We're making good progress. Um, we're currently uh, embarking on the land use chapters, which always seem to garner the most interest in town, um, both the existing land use and future land use. Um, so I would encourage everyone to weigh in and make your voice heard. You can go on Lumio. Um, it's like a chat room, and you can have conversations with people and um, give your opinion. We're going to have our final public forum sometime in October. We'll let you know as soon as um, we know the date on that. And of course, you can always attend our meetings. In fact, we love that. Um, and you have a chance to speak. And they are the first Thursday of the month. So stay tuned. Also, as you all know, on the left-hand side of the um, town website, if you scrolled about halfway down, there's um, a little flame, I think. And then it says comprehensive plan. And you click on that. And there's just a wealth of information, should you have any interest in reading any of it. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Councilor Garvin? Thank you. Um, I want to report on behalf of EcoMaine. Um, for those that don't know, we are a owner member community of the regional um, waste management um, operation over at EcoMaine. And um, both Matt and I were at their uh, annual meeting last month, uh, which was a really good program. Um, but the thing I wanted to draw everybody's attention to is. Um, an increase in recycling contamination that you've probably been reading about in the newspaper, probably been seeing a lot of good information posted not only on our website, the town website, but also some of the social media um, that the town operates. Um, the recycling committee has been doing a really good job uh, along with the communication staff at Town Hall of trying to get the word out about this, but um, just want to draw the, the, the public's awareness to this increasing problem um, and specifically the the silver bullets that are right here at town hall um, we get a report weekly uh, that indicates a percent contamination of loads that get hauled over to eco main and consistently at least half of the contaminated loads are ones from here at town hall uh, obviously there's less monitoring that goes on here so there's more likely to be things like recyclables that are thrown in in a plastic bag, which is not supposed to be done, um, or maybe other material that's not even recyclable. But um, as of right now, EcoMain is not charging back to their communities um, for these contaminated loads, though they do have as part of their bylaws a fee schedule associated with this. So it is something that should it continue, and especially should it get worse, um, we're going to see a financial impact from. So I really encourage members of the community to be more diligent in how they're handling their material. And if you see other people that are maybe not um, uh, handling things the way they should be, maybe give a nice um, and friendly uh, little nudge to, to encourage them to do it the right way. The other thing I'll draw your attention to is that both on the EcoMain website or in the Apple or Android app stores, you can get EcoMain's Recyclopedia app. You can actually link to it from our town website too. Um, so if people have questions about what they can or cannot recycle, it's a really handy uh, in the palm of your hand tool for figuring that kind of stuff out. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, we'll move along. Uh, could we please have the Finance Committee report? Sure, thank you very much. 
So uh, starting off with the dashboard, um, these numbers represent the uh, fiscal year end, and I know we've got two different agenda items uh, coming up on our full agenda tonight um, about carry forward balances and a couple of accounts that are um, overspent. Um, I would say though that looking first at the key expenditures section, um, I'm continue to be impressed year after year of how close um, on, an, on an accounting basis we come to the actual budgeted amount. So um, I would say kudos to Matt and the staff um, for how they watch and monitor that. And even things that are somewhat variable and, and unpredictable like police overtime, public works overtime, um, you know, uh, things like that, we, we, we really come very close to the budgeted amount. So um, that's, uh, I think a, a, a sign of good fiscal management. Um, the other thing I wanted to draw attention to on the revenue side is in the state school subsidy line where um, you know we, we're showing it green in terms of favorability, um, but as the notes indicate too, there's um, a clear illustration of the impact to the reduction of state aid and education. So um, between last year's projected amount and the amount that came in for this year, um, a $650,000 um, uh, uh, reduction or, or you know shortfall year over year. Um, while positive to our current year budget, uh, it looks like we got a little bit more from the state than we had actually put into our budget. Um, a big year over year difference there. So um, those are the things I wanted to highlight. I know Sarah had a question um, prior to the meeting about um, expenses on the legal services line. Matt, you sent around an email. Did you want to touch on that at all? Yes, for sir. everybody's benefit. I, I may do that uh, during the in your uh, report. In the report, okay. as far as uh, when, we, when we address the uh, year end Super. adjustments. Okay. Um, other than that, any questions on the I, I had finances? Two questions. The first was for the revenue. Um, I think I can figure it out, but I just wanted to make sure I was right. Um, page seven of eight uh, for the officer row rental, we're at 31% of expected revenue, even though we were at 100% occupancy. I'm guessing that's because the whatever building number 326 was broken out on a different line, but I just wanted to verify that. I believe it is. Yeah. Yes. So we're actually running ahead of expected. Correct. Yes, right. yes. And then the other was um, in the, the ex, uh, which one is this? It's one of the, ex, the expense ones. There's a number of line items that are just in, uh, labeled business card. I assume those are items that just came in and they haven't been categorized yet. Which page are you on? Um, for example, page 10 of 64 at the very bottom is one example of a business card. Um, I assume it's a uh, town credit card where the yes. entries have come in, they haven't been categorized. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. Right. Uh, that was it. Let me just get to that point, though, just to double check on that, Councilor Straw. Yeah. Also start, what page was that? Uh, for, uh, pay, one example is the first one I found was 10 of 64. Uh, bottom line, for example, sub account 2008 training. Uh, Looks like Chief Williams' card. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So oh. that's, that's the credit card that is for the police department. So that, yeah, and no. so eventually, who the, the actual description will be updated to reflect what it was. Yes, yep. Yep. Right. The, and we'll have the detail with the invoice that'll Got it. associate right. with it. That was it. Yep, thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> any other questions on any of the other control distribution reports? This is just all what you were referring to, Council Straw. Those in yep. those those reports. Nothing else on any of that. Okay, thanks. We'll move along now. No, I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah. If, if I may, I would like to just uh, note a couple of additional items on the on the dashboard. If that would be fine with the council. Sure. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, that's right. Uh, Portland had like gift shop sales. Uh, if you take a look at that revenue side, were off the charts. Uh, the six hundred eighty thousand dollars worth in sales that they uh, booked over the fiscal year. Uh, we were anticipating five hundred and twenty. Uh, that uh, Gene Gross was reporting this morning at the department head meeting that their sales are still tracking extremely robust. I mean, the numbers uh, as far as visitors and transactions, they're looking at four to five thousand dollars a day now in sales where a year ago they were looking at about $3,000 uh, on a good day. So we should be looking at robust numbers again if the, you know, if the weather holds and the, and the consumers keep buying. But uh, that's something we may look at as, as a strong trend going forward. And then uh, a couple of other areas that we're looking at as far as our uh, building permits. It shows that we were down a little bit, but still it doesn't 
uh, it doesn't state the over uh, the, in the significance of the fact that we were still at 157 percent of anticipated revenues on that, uh, roughly almost eighty thousand dollars more than what than what we were anticipating. So the the trades continue to to be robust within the town, which is a good thing as far as building permits, and that's that will also be translating into an increase in the assessment this year on the on the taxable value for the town. Uh, so those are good things. And then our revenue uh, on excise taxes as well. I was glad to see that that came in above where we were, and that was due to a, a robust uh, a robust June as well. And a number of cars. Uh, Terry Olson was reporting this morning at the PAC meeting that a number of folks are purchasing their cars out of state. So uh, we're getting a lot of different transactions that are coming in. It's it's kind of a new flavor that's happened, but uh, but our excise taxes are still are still tracking in a strong way. So. And then, as Councillor Garvin did say, I do want to take the, take a moment to thank our department heads. They are fastidious when it comes to addressing and take, making sure that our expenditures stay on track and in line with where we need to be. And uh, our staff really work hard at trying to keep that keep that under wraps. Matt, quick question for you um, on the gift shop sales, just because I know with conversations ongoing about revenues at Fort Williams and things like that, there's people that might not have been as plugged into this as sure. you know all of us are all the time can you just reiterate for folks where those revenues, revenues go, go and for what they're um, what they can be applied to yes the the revenues that are generated at Portland headlight are specifically earmarked to be in support of Portland headlight and the operations there too they, they do help with the cost for our you know for for our greeters and our Rangers but overall that money needs to be spent in support of the headlight so it, it's under a 501c3 corporation. So it's a it's a it's a specific uh, it's a specific uh, organization that they have there on the headlight, and that's why you'll even see that delineated as a separate parcel. If you looked at that on the uh, on the tax maps, you'll see that the, the headlight parcel itself is is a separate parcel. But yes, the revenues that do come to it, while they are strong, they are dedicated to them specifically. Thanks. Yep. Thanks for asking that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so now we've come to the opportunity for citizens to address the council for items that are not on tonight's agenda. Is there anyone that would like to speak to the town council tonight? You have three minutes. You need to give us your name and address, three minutes apiece. Thank you. My name is Rebecca Little. I live at 4 South Street with my fiance, James Steinberg. Petition to the Cape Elizabeth Town Council to prevent traffic from entering our private roads from the public road and to support the reinstallation of our private gate. We, the underside homeowners of Cell Street and Stevenson Street private ways, private ways respectfully request the town council order that municipal measures be taken to prevent access from the public Astor Lane where it joins our private Cell Street. We also ask the council to declare that it supports our reinstallation, our chain gate at the end of Cell Street where it connects with Astor Lane to the town, with town police protection during the reinstallation. We ask for this order and declaration for the following reasons. We have the legal right and responsibility to control and prevent public access on our private ways, including by installing a chain gate. A privately owned road is a road over which neither the municipality nor the general public has the right to pass by vehicle or on foot. Anyone using or repairing a privately owned road without the owner's permission is subject to an action by the owner for trespass, 14 MRSA 7551-A and 7552, and Hatch v. Donnell, 74, Maine 163, 1882, C. Hannemans v. Moray and Hupper, Knox City, Superior Court, docket number RE-03-016, Wheeler J. Court held that abutters on a private road had the right to maintain an electronic gate where the road met the public road, despite the objection of one of the abutters, where the emergency vehicles could open or otherwise break through the gate. The court stating that the gate was necessary, usual, and proper, and does not unreasonably interfere with the use of the roadway by the objecting abutters. The road to us and our guests and exposes us to greater liability. Finally, it unjustifiably and discriminatorily compromises the seven-year-old child's safety. Under the main human 
Rights Act, a public entity must reasonably accommodate individuals with disabilities. Under Title II of the Federal American Disabilities Act, a public entity may not allow the alteration of facilities that will discriminatorily and adversely affect individuals with disabilities. Immediately after the planning board approved the gate's removal, the abutter removed it, even though the gate did not block access to her property. We reinstalled the gate on June 24th on advice of our attorney and with a notice to the town police. On June 25th, however, the abutter advised advised our attorney with notice to the town police. On June 25th, however, the abutter again removed our gate in the permissive presence of the town police. With the gate down, we have already been subjected to the substantial increase in public traffic, including trucks. We understand that the town council has the ultimate authority to control traffic in the town and to manage its public ways. We therefore ask the council to order the measures be taken by the town to prevent access from the public Astor Lane where it joins private South Street. Ms. Little, and that your it declares time is up. supports of our reinstallation of the gate in the presence with the protection of the town police. Thank you for your consideration of our petition. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Julie Munns. I live at 5 South Street. I'm a direct abutter to the um, projects. Um, I'm here for a personal safety issue. My son is seven years old and has severe epilepsy, and as a result of it being uncontrolled, he has a lack of awareness at all times. Each seizure creates irreversible damage to his cognitive abilities. As you can imagine, this means everything from his memory to his basic understanding of primary safety is impaired. He is fearless because he doesn't have understanding of what can cause bodily harm or damage. He doesn't understand the danger surrounding cars or traffic, which is why we bought our house on a private den end. After Easton's diagnosis, we moved and chose our home because it allowed us some environmental control to assist with his safety, both from the interior of our home, which is one level, but also the dead end and the gate, which keeps traffic mostly limited to those who know our concerns. My son needs that gate, and that will likely never change in the foreseeable future. That gate should have never come down, period. I am here asking you, the town council, to protect us, please, and put it on your agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening. <clears throat> My name is Josh Nappy. I live at 7 Stevenson Street, corner of Stevenson and South. Been there for 10 years. And I'm just here to support the reinstallation of the gate. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Henry Steinberg, 13 Hunts Point Road. Some while ago, I sent all of you, I believe, a letter, in actual fact, a copy of what Mrs. Munns just said, stating that the removal of the gate would endanger the child. One of you actually did respond to me. The others, unfortunately, did not. After the planning board reached what I considered to be the wrong decision, uh, I wrote again, stating that I thought that the uh, milk of human kindness had been lost in Cape Elizabeth. Um, actually, I did receive responses from all but one in that particular instance, saying that, well, they're very sorry, but they were caught up in other things, and one had actually been seen Mr. Sturgis, I believe, and Mr. Sturgis had recommended that they wait or something. It was planning for it. But clearly, there's a greater issue. I've been part of the planning board, or I was, for a while. And now I realize that nobody on the boards are actually professionals at the board type of things they are. I'm not a planning board, I'm a planning board um, trainee. I mean, I don't have experience in that. And a lot of people in Cape Elizabeth are busy, so they don't have a lot of time to come to meetings like this. So what happens is that the advisors on the group, planning board, town council, a poor appeals board, normally do or go with what the expert, or at least what considered to be the expert, to be, regardless of whether it's right or wrong. And thereby, of course, hangs the problem. So my proposal is this, that something gets done in the way of an ombudsman. It's interesting that you're all actually looking at me because when I was on the board of the planning board, many times everybody has other things to do with pieces of paper, but they don't pay attention. So at least, you know, I can say that you did. Um, I believe an ombudsman is necessary. It would save a lot of problems. Look what happens uh, at this particular instance. 
I believe a wrong decision is made, and clearly there are uh, things coming up which you may or may not be able to discuss, but are lawsuits, etc. The cost of that, both to the town and to the individuals, is horrendous. However, had it been settled beforehand, which is what I'd suggested that they try to do and it was passed over, it would save a lot of problems, a lot of heartache, a lot of money, and a lot of bad feeling. So an ombudsman who was elected, who had some understanding of what's called maladministration, big word, not just a big meaning, would possibly be able to avoid those problems that occur in civil actions. Um, I'd be grateful if you could discuss it or think about it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chairman, members of the Council, Town Manager. My name is Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil Solutions. We have been asked by um, a group of uh, individuals who live on South Street to be able to uh, address the Council this evening. And I'm here specifically at the request of Chris Munns, uh, who is one of the uh, homeowners who was out of town and was not able to be here this evening. Uh, the long and short of it is you've, you've heard many of the arguments, um, notwithstanding the litigation that's ongoing uh, regarding the planning board's decision that's not an issue for the evening. Uh, essentially, as Ms. Munns had uh, previously indicated, the biggest issue right now for the people who do live on South Street, which is a designated private access way or a portion of it, and then the rest of it is a private road uh, that connects to a public right of way that they would simply, until the resolution of the effect or the, uh, uh, the litigation between the, uh, the town and these individuals regarding the planning board action, simply to be able to have the council address the issue regarding a gate or a chain of some sort, certainly which would have a knox box so that any uh, emergency access vehicles would be able to get through it at any point. Uh, but that vehicular traffic, public vehicular traffic, would not actually be able to use the road. There is, in fact, a public road that literally skirts the issue, the, uh, the area of South Street, uh, that comes essentially from uh, Spurwink over to uh, Sawyer, excuse me, over to um, Astor Lane. So what we're really looking at is just those few individuals who bought properties and owned properties along the private section of South Street to be able to uh, at least until the council puts this on their agenda to further uh, discuss this action, to at least allow them to be able to put up a temporary gate, uh, ostensibly a permanent gate, but temporary for the moment would be fine, just to restrict vehicular access. We're not trying to restrict the pedestrian access for the people who own properties that are within the, the original development. That is a main law that those people have the ability to walk down uh, an area such as a private road, but it does not include vehicular traffic. And toward that end, that's the main concern of the people that are on the board right now. We'd just like to be able to have, excuse me, we'd like to be able to have the council uh, put this on your agenda, if you would, at this earliest opportunity, simply to be able to address this concern about some type of chain or Knox Box gate at the end of the road. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the, the council? My name is Marissa Har. I live at 2 Stevenson Street, which is um, next to, connects into South Street. Um, and I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old, two little kids, and I'm, I'm here because I'm concerned about the increase in traffic that I have seen um, since that gate has come down. So I, I'm asking um, to, um, supporting the petition to put the gate back up. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Jessica Mathis. I live at 2 Stevenson Street with my fiance Marissa and our two girls who are five and seven. Um, with this gate being down, our seven-year-old is no longer able to ride her bike with her friends in our neighborhood. And for her, that was a very big deal this spring was that she was able to finally ride her bike around our neighborhood with her friends. She's a very timid seven-year-old. Um, it was a huge step for her and with this, severe increase of traffic. We've had to take that away from her. There are no sidewalks, there are no shoulders on our private road on, on Stevenson Street or South Street, and it is dangerous watching cement trucks or other vehicles who are not familiar with our families. Um, and 
frankly, uh, uh, vehicles who have just total disregard for the speed limits and stop signs in our area, um, they do pose, it's, it's very dangerous. Um, and I would really love to see this gate go back up for my neighbor's families, for my family, and just for the safety of everybody around us. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, the public comment period is closed. I would like to say for the benefit of the audience here and at home that we are actively in litigation on the issues that have been presented here in public comment on the, and on the advice of the town attorney. The councils will not be commenting. So, thank you. Can I ask just a couple logistical questions with no opinion? I, I, I've not been down there, so I, I, I'm a little confused what people are talking about. So, may I just ask, um, does... Aster Lane currently cut all the way through to the Columbus neighborhood, or is it not a through road? No. It's not a through road? No, but it's so, not. So the traffic is going to a construction site, not all the way through to Mitchell? Not all the way through to uh, Mitchell, no, no. Okay, and then my second question is, um, this gate that was up and then was taken down, that was, as I understand it, not on a town road, but a private road? I think it was at the end of Astor Lane, like where the two came together. There was, was a it chain. Physically on town owned property or private owned property? I think there's, some, yeah, there's some gray area when it comes to that. As far as John, John Wall uh, came here this evening on request just in case we had any kind of questions. But I think there is some issues related to where where it was located, if it was on the, on the end of Astor Lane or if it was on the beginning of. South Street, so it's kind of, I think there's survey data that needs to, or that I don't have access to that would explain that where it was. And just my final question is, who took the gate down? What, what prompted the gate that had? I think it was the person that, to be taken down? yeah, I think it was the person who's building the new house on, that was, a, that was approved at the planning board level. I think they removed the, uh, the chain and the bollards that were there. And, and where's the house being built? South Street slash Astor Lane, where it loops around. Vague, which, which road it's on? They got a private access way off from the end of Astor Lane to come onto their property, which has frontage on both roads, which is one straight road coming through. But the public section is Astor Lane, the private section is South Street. I really would encourage counselors to, you know, this matter is already involved with our attorneys, and I, would, I think we should leave it there. I just, I just want to picture, I mean, I clearly have to drive down there. I just didn't know what people were talking about. Thank you. I could, I could show you on a map if you wanted to That's give me a call. <laughs> Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Yeah, I have a couple of questions as well. I mean, I mean, other than the emails that we received, this is the first I'm hearing today that we're in litigation about this, that we can't talk about it. So, I mean, if the attorney's here, I'd love to know procedurally where we stand, what's happening, because... Or do we need to go into an executive session and meet with our lawyer? Because I've got maybe at least a dozen questions to know what the heck's going on because I don't think we've been kept up to date as I'd like to have been. So where do we stand? What's our timeline? What's happening? If you could let us know, because I feel very in the dark right now. Yeah. Um. Let me just say that uh, this is John Wall, by the way, town attorney. Um, uh, many of the issues down there uh, involve uh, private issues. Um, to the extent um, the, the town's uh, issues are involved in this, um, it arises out of a planning board decision with regard to extension of a private road from the end of Astor Lane, which will allow, uh, make it a buildable lot for these people who are applicants before the planning board. That decision of the planning board is currently on appeal to the superior court. Um, uh, there may be some discussions amongst the parties about trying to resolve this. I don't know where those stand at the moment, but last Friday, that was my understanding is that there was some effort um, afoot for the, the private owners down there to try and work something out. But if it, so there may be a stay of the, of the superior court case pending those efforts. If the superior court case continues, there'll be briefing and a decision 
depending on how long the stay will be, um, it will be some time between either September to October, November, some kind of time frame like that. Okay, can I see if I can ask the planning board decision that's been appealed? Yes. You're telling me that, from what I understand looking at the map, we have South Street, which is a private way, right? Uh, my understanding is that South Street is a combination of private way and private access way, but yes. Right, okay. And then, so I can fully understand, then you have Astor Lane that is public. Correct. And so what the planning board decided was to extend a private, a new private way off of Astor, but just before South, that makes it connect? Well, those type of issues are what the Spirit Court in part is, is going to be asked to, to, to deal with. And that's where, from the purposes of, of addressing that, it's important to let the process work itself out. The Planning Board, obviously, under the ordinance, is the, the, the body who is uh, conferred with authority to deal with these kind of issues. And the parties involved in that, at least some of them, have appealed that Spirit Court, which is the next step in the process. So. Okay. Next question that sure. for if I have my own private way, what is the law within the town or the state that says I can or cannot put up a gate? If you're talking simply private simply rights, it's between you and anybody else who has private rights with regard to that way, okay. generally speaking. There may be deed restrictions that deal with these type of issues. It's why when you have disputes like this and parties can't agree on it, it's best for the court to work these things through. And you're saying it's going to be September or October before the court hopefully works this through? As I say, hopefully this is a situation where all the parties who have an interest with regard to the private issues down there are able to work something out. The last I heard, there was some kind of uh, movement afoot for that to take place. Uh, whether that succeeds or not remains to be seen. But if the parties want us to stay the lawsuit in order to allow those efforts to continue, that may cause some delay in terms of putting the case in the hands of the judge if it ever gets that far. So that's sort of where the time frame is, anywhere between September and November, depending on how long the stay would be. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure who was next. Councillor Straw. Uh, so um, am I correct that under state law, uh, when the planning board is operating this stance, we as a town council are barred from any way dabbling or interfering with their decisions? Is that what, right? What I'm suggesting mm -hmm. is that this, to the extent the town has um, the uh, authority to deal with this question, it is one that the ordinance has placed in the planning board's uh, authority and the planning board at, should be given the opportunity to reach its decision and to the extent there's any complaint about that it goes to the next level superior court so let's see if we can bifurcate this there's whatever the planning board decision is which we're supposed to have follow the proper process we're not supposed to be involved in that it goes through the process courts and whatnot uh, then there's this issue involving the gate is the gate part of the planning board's decision um, I, I think, well, and again, that's an issue that Superior Court is going to have so to rule on okay. what, what aspect of this, uh, there's an argument, there are arguments that are going to go both ways on this, and that's why I'm saying to the extent... So the gate might be part of the planning board decision such that we perhaps should not be down. The gate was certainly an aspect of the application, and the planning board's approval has a certain impact on these people getting access, which would include taking down the gate. What aspect of this is constitutes public issue as opposed to private issue is part of what the court is going to have to decide. Councilor Garvin. Um, <clears throat> I watched the planning board meeting when this was decisioned. And if I recall, and I see a member of the planning board and Maureen um, here, maybe they can speak to this. Um, but there were multiple conditions of approval uh, that were granted with this. And I think one of those conditions was the installation of signage um, indicating restricted access and all that kind of stuff. And I just was curious, at, sort of irrespective of the gate and the ongoing litigation, that was a condition of the approval and I didn't know if that had happened yet. I don't know the status of that on the ground, but I understand that as part of the approval, there was signage that was required. 
Is there, are there is there a plan for installation or? It's my understanding that the signs have been ordered and they are being planned to be installed uh, as soon as they come in. From what I, from what I, understand. Okay. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Wall? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. And now moving on, could we please have the town manager's monthly report? Happy to, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, the new fiscal year began on July 1st, and the town office was closed on the afternoon of June 29th. And this allowed the business office and the staff to perform their year-end closing duties, which was very successful, and allowed the operations to open without any challenges on July 2nd as the new fiscal year began. I want to extend my appreciation to the tax office and the business office for their efforts in a successful year-end and a successful beginning of a new year. As the fiscal year concluded, it's also important to note that the town committed approximately $30.5 million in property taxes. And as of this morning, had collected all but just over $70,000 of that. This is from roughly 4,500 properties in Cape Elizabeth, of which there are only 15 remaining that uh, we need to collect taxes from. I'd like to extend an appreciation to Deborah Lane and her tax office for their excellent work on processing this incredible volume and to the taxpayers for their diligence as well. It's a successful year and thank you for that. As Councillor Garvin spoke about uh, the recycling, that took a good portion of the majority of my, <laughs> of my manager's report out. Um, but a couple things I'd like to, to touch on with that is, you know, at the present time, as Councillor Garvin said, we are an owner community. So if there is contamination, we do not get charged for contaminated loads as they are right now. But it's not a question of if, it's a question of when uh, the town may end up getting charged for that, which, is, uh, which will be unfortunate because it ranges from the, the, the amount of contamination is how the fees get assessed. So uh, the important thing is that we, we all need to work on our recycling and to improve that. The good news is that the recycling, the recycled materials at the recycling center generally run from zero to five percent contamination. So folks are doing a great job when it comes to working with our, you know, at, at the recycling center. But it's out back that we're running into trouble. Uh, recent loads had showed such indicated items as metal yard decor, tarps, and there were two wakeboards. So they apparently didn't make it through the Fourth of July holiday, but they made it to the silver bullets out back. So if we could work on on improving that, that would be great. And uh, secondly in that area is that uh, other towns are also facing the same challenge uh, and it's specifically with the unattended silver bullets and ultimately we all come you know, have questions when it comes down to saying is it time to recycle should I recycle this or should I not recycle this with these uncertain times when it comes to contamination and our recycling, what is accepted, it's probably better safe to say, if you are in doubt, throw it out. Uh, specifically with plastic bags, that seems to be the largest item that we have contaminating our recycling. It's the, you know, the plastic bags that you get at Hannaford's or at any of the local stores. And folks do a great job containing their recyclables, but they throw it all into the bin. So if you could, please empty them out and then, and then throw the bag away. or. It's the plastic bags that are really, really killing us. On a final note, I'd like to take the opportunity to recognize and congratulate Community Services Director Kathy Raftis and Library Director Kyle, Kyle Neugebauer on completion of the Leadership Academy recently at SMCC. Uh, this is a seven week professional development course that was attended by staff members from surrounding communities as South Portland, Cumberland County Government, Yarmouth, Scarborough, Falmouth, and other surrounding communities. And they did a great job and they had a nice uh, as, a, as a graduate of the academy myself, uh, it was nice to see two more Cape Elizabeth leaders go through. So thank you for that. That's the extent of my report. Thank you. Uh, any questions for the town manager? No? Okay. Uh, our next item is review of the draft minutes of the June 11, 2018 uh, town council meeting. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous, thank you. Next item, number 100, consideration of a standing renewable energy committee. Uh, last month, we got into a discussion about this item, which uh, was a, had come from us to us from the ordinance committee, a draft proposal for a new standing committee. We tabled that. 
So before we do anything, we need to have a motion to take that back off the table. Um, could I have a motion? So moved. Councilor Straw, is there a second? It needs to be seconded. Councilor Lennon, any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous to take this back off the table so that now we can uh, talk about it. So um, I actually had some comments and some thoughts and edits about this uh, proposed committee, which I emailed to the council and I also provided paper copies. But before I go there, I have another concern, um, which may, uh, which I'd like to discuss and possibly putting this back on the table again um, for August. And that is that um, the minutes of the ordinance committee meeting on January 22 and, and March 22 that in which they deliberated on their draft are not available. And um, I spoke to the town manager today about that and um, he has found them and has put, asked our clerk to put them on the website. But this does concern me. This is really a public access uh, issue, a FOA issue. And you know, we still do not have minutes up from the Sperling School Committee deliberations. It was an issue in 2016 with another ad hoc committee. Um, so I, I do think that the council needs to do a better job of making sure that, it, that its minutes, the minutes of its meetings are posted, are available for the public. And the other thought I had about this was I, you know, when I tried to go back and look at the minutes to see how the ordinance committee, you know, how they discussed what their thoughts were, who was present, what contributions were made, of course I couldn't do that. So, um, that's something I think council needs to discuss, and I, I, I know the manager wants to speak to it as well. Yeah, I will say I did. I had done both minutes for both meetings, and uh, quite honestly, I'd sent them to the committee, and I completely didn't post them. And I apologize for that. It was an oversight on my part. I had them turned around fairly quickly too, so I, I'll die a thousand deaths on it. But I do apologize for not. Posting them. I did get them to Deb, and we will have them. But I, I didn't want to have her backfill it, so I asked her to post them after the meeting because I didn't yeah. want to. Uh, I needed the scorecard to be accurate, so. Okay. But we will have it up there first thing in the morning. Councillor Jordan. Well, I. You, they'll be posted. You said soon. Tomorrow, I think you said. Yes. So, um, I'm not sure we need to table it. I would rather. I was going to make a motion after looking at your thing that we just send it back to ordinance because, I mean, this is like a complete rewrite, mm -hmm. you know, not anywhere <laughs> close to what we had drafted. So I wouldn't want to be altering it at the table the anyhow mm -hmm. or in August where after mm -hmm. you get to look at it. So I think if this is something that's to be considered, it, it should go back to ordinance to take your notes and you're welcome to come and and share more after you learn more from the minutes and we can have another ordinance committee meeting about this and then bring it back, you know, probably by then it'll be September. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the reality is if we tape it till August, then I'm gonna make the same motion in August, which will just put it to the ordinance mm -hmm. committee anyhow, so. That's fine. Yeah, and one of, the, one of my thoughts is, I hope most of you have had a chance to read, but I, you know, I was just working on this today. Uh, is that my concern is that the, the, the focus is so narrow, you know, and I, I, I'd like to see it be a little broader, but anyhow. But I think that's a great suggestion, so. Councilor Straw? I'd, I'd like to deal with it tonight. Um, I like a number of your edits. I think we could incorporate the two, but if, if a majority doesn't want to deal with it tonight, uh, we kick the can down the road. But this has been going on for a while. Uh, the point of having these committees is they go out, they do research, they come up with proposals and recommendations, they give them the town council, we weigh and make a decision. Uh, this ad hoc committee went out, they did all of that work, they came up with a proposal report to the town council a year and a half ago that we still haven't acted on. So the fact, I, I would like to deal with this sooner rather than later. No, I, I appreciate that. Uh, council, I think, Councilor Lennon maybe next? Um, I agree with what Chris just said, and I was thinking maybe we could add it to the workshop we have next week, um, because I personally don't want to just send this back to ordinance with no feedback from us on these two versions and guidance, because I, I personally like the one you guys came up with. I mean, I like 
It's just, it's completely different. And I mean, there are parts of this I think are okay, but I don't, this is more a report to the council. It seems narrow and focused. I like the education aspect of this where you're gonna, you can talk to private citizens, you can give them advice on how to make their house greener. So I, I think we need to put, I think we need a half an hour conversation on this in a workshop or something to say, hey, we like A, B, and C on this one, but we like this, this, and this. So that, you, again, you're gonna waste three months because you're gonna come back and we're gonna, you know what I'm saying? Like this is, it's a complete waste of time to send it back to ordinance without the whole council coming to some consensus on what we want this committee to be. And, you know, I agree with Chris. It's like we have really dragged this out. So I think we need to expedite it. Thank you, Councilor Randall. Um, that's exactly what I was going to say because uh, when we discussed this in ordinance, it was clear that the ad hoc committee really um, had been looking for us to take some action. And I think maybe if we had had a little more discussion as the whole council, it would have been more productive in ordinance. Um, I think the way we tried to structure it was not narrow, but a little bit more um, vague, and we can talk about this more at, at workshop, but we had some ideas for how this was going to look down the line, and that's sort of what we were thinking. So I think it may be very valuable to have a council discussion at workshop. All right, thank you, Councilor Garvin. Um, I kind of split the difference. I, I can't remember what we have for July uh, workshop agenda, whether or not that's already somewhat well, full or not. But yeah, I can um, tell you. The, the point I was going to make is that um, I believe we're all, uh, there's the ordinance committee, but I believe all councilors are ex officio members of every mm -hmm. committee, correct? So I would say that it might make most sense to refer this to ordinance where ordinance could take action on it, but have um, as many of us who want to or have an interest in being there, be there to participate in the discussion. And then the ordinance committee can vote it out of ordinance and back to the council. I think that's probably the fastest point A to point B on this. Um, and I would certainly make myself available for whenever that ordinance committee meeting is, so. Okay, I, I, I like that idea. I think um, uh, that could be faster. Our uh, July workshop, which is a week from tonight, is quite full. I mean, it's, it's gonna be a long workshop, and honestly, I don't think we have time for this. So that's a great solution, Council Garvin. Um, does everyone else agree? We, we'll, we could, well, once what what answer. would happen is we would, Council Garvin's suggestion, and Council Jordan seems to agree uh, by you know nodding, <laughs> that we would vote to send this back to ordinance. Hopefully the ordinance committee could work uh, could schedule something fairly quickly. Um, those of us councils, I certainly would would be there myself, could attend um, and provide input, and uh, then get this back to the full council. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's a great idea. Councilor Straw? I would simply note as uh, Councilor Jordan noted last month, um, I formally request that at, uh, since it's not on this agenda, at the next agenda, I am ready to move forward and vote to authorize the town manager to move forward with putting together proposals and seeking bids on the greenfield aspect of the uh, new renewable energy report. I would like to have that dealt with soon. Of the, of the what? Uh, the, so they gave us a uh, renewable right, the original, energy yeah, report. Yeah. They had okay. per, That's what you're clump about. it into two groups. One was uh, dealt with uh, putting a system on top of the high school, and there's some issues with that mm -hmm. one. That requires us to spend some money. That I understand tabling for a little bit. The other was, uh, a greenfield proposal involving a solar system using private, um, uh, basically there's this uh, buy lease program that a number of the surrounding communities are using and putting it on what is the true dump at the transfer station. Um, that proposal to me seems like we're ready to either vote it up or down mm -hmm. and I would like to have that on the agenda for the next meeting. Well, you made that request at the yep. last town council meeting, yes. and that is on our agenda, which is not on the website yet because Great. the town manager and I haven't finalized it, right. but it is on our, our draft agenda for a week from tonight. Uh, for the workshop. For the workshop to discuss the, the, the solar proposal, which I know you mentioned it's <laughs> last month it's turnkey. It really isn't. I think this is going to be, I think we'll be discussing this more than one workshop, but we certainly need to begin. Right. So, a Sounds week good. from tonight, we, we are going to start that discussion. Great. So, thank you. Yep. Yeah, sure. Councilor Jordan, would you like to make a motion? <laughs> I motion that we send this back to ordinance, and anybody is welcome to attend. <laughs> is there a second? Second. Councilor Straw, any more discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. All right. Next item is... <clears throat>
Oh, I forgot to ask for public comment for that. Oh well. Next item is number 105. Ocean House Pizza is up for their liquor license renewal. Would anyone from the public like to address this item? No? No, thank you. What I would do is ask the town clerk if there um, is any input or uh, that we need to be aware of from the police or the fire department. Thank you very much. As we do with all our uh, liquor licenses, whether they're uh, new or renewal, which this is a renewal, uh, we ask for review by police, fire, and code enforcement, and there are no concerns uh, to report relating to this application this evening. Great. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve this application? Second. Councilor Randall, is there a second? Councilor Lennon, is there any discussion on this application? No? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. All right, the next item is item number 106. Uh, this is a request from the Fort Williams Park Foundation for a change to their bylaws. And <clears throat> what is developed is that they, they are apparently unable to make any change without council approval. That's the way their bylaws was written originally. This is not... Uh, the situation we have with the Library Foundation, and and uh, it seems rather strange. So, we uh, they have been invited to come to the council to to discuss this. I'd like to ask the manager if he'd like to speak any more to this. Sure, I'd be happy to, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Lynn Schaefer and I had the opportunity to discuss this uh, roughly about almost a month or so ago, but after our last council meeting, but before this one, and. She said, did you understand that the council had the opportunity or is needed to help us make any changes or needed to approve any changes to the, to the bylaws? I said, I, I was not aware of that, but since you're not a, a committee or an organization of the town or, or a department of the town, that seems a bit strange because we don't have that restriction in other organizations. Right. Well, how do we get that changed? Uh, well, you can come to the council and make that request and since, and that's why they're here this evening and I know Lynn's here and she can explain more of that, but uh, they have some mm -hmm. other ideas that they'd like to do in the future, but uh, wouldn't like to keep coming back each time they wanted to make a change, and this is a kind of a keystone change for them, so. Yes, Hi. Um, I name and address, please, <laughs> <laughs> and affiliation. Lynn Schaefer, Shore Road, Preston, Fort Williams Park Foundation. Um, I don't know that I really have a lot to add beyond what was in mm -hmm. our request to the council. Uh, it just seems kind of unusual for an organization that's an independent 501c3 to have this in the bylaws. It also takes some of your precious time that doesn't seem really necessary. And so we thought it was time to raise the question and ask if that requirement if we may amend our bylaws with your approval one final time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions for Lynn? No. Thank you. So uh, is there a motion to approve the Fort Williams Park Foundation's request to change uh, their bylaws Article 9, Amendment Section 1D? Councilor Lennon, so is, is there a second? Councilor Garvin, is there any discussion? Councilor Garvin. I just wanted to point out, as per the discussion you and I had this afternoon, uh, Jessica, yeah. that um, I've previously recused myself from matters involving the Fort Williams Park Foundation due to my wife having served on the board of directors. Um, she's concluded her service on the board, and so uh, with that conflict no longer existing, that's why I'm choosing to participate on this item. So, Thank you. Does any councilor uh, disagree with Councilor Garvin's uh, belief that he no longer has a conflict? I didn't think so. <laughs> Thank you. So back to the, uh, the motion. We have a motion and seconded. Is there any more discussion on the uh, Fort Williams Park Foundation's request? Oh, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. All right, item number 107. We have a request from the Fort Williams Park Foundation to improve continued uh, ecological restoration of the Cliff Walk landscape project at Fort Williams Park. Um, and we have folks that are going to speak to this, but what we had done as a council last year is we had approved some of the work uh, that was funded at that point, and we asked that they come back and discuss with us the rest of their work once their funding was all in place. So that's why we're 
talking now or uh, looking at this item now. So uh, I'm sure that they have something to present to us. Um, and I'd like to ask the town manager if you want to say anything at this point. Sure, thank you, Madam Chairman. That's James McCain's here this evening to kind of walk, uh, walk through what their anticipated plan of work is uh, for the coming year or so. And uh, I'll get out of his way so he can explain it. But uh, thanks, James. Is this all set up to go? Should be good to go. Mm -hmm. oh. it's Except for that part, I'll get back out. Sorry. Okay. Password for tech. Um, Thank you. Great. Okay, so my name is James McCain with Fort Wayne's Park Foundation I'm with the Sawyer Street in South Portland. And I'm here just to give you an update on the Cliff Walk Landscape Project, which since we uh, met you last August. Lean into the mic a little yes. more. Okay, great. That's better, thank since you. Since we were here last August, we have uh, made additional progress on controlling invasive plants across the site. Uh, with volunteers, both corporate and from school, area schools and staff, uh, doing a lot of cutting and seed collecting, but also with Vegetation Control Services, which is a professional herbicide applicator and mower out of Athel Mass. They've been up to do some work as well. So it's our continued integrated approach of sort of timed cutting, followed by some judicious use of herbicides, um, according to best ways to reduce plant invasive plant cover. So we've made a lot of progress throughout the site, which you can see out when you're out there walking around. Uh, a lot of native plants have actually started to recolonize some of those areas that have been cleared. Uh, most recently, we have contracted with Off the Beaten Path Trail Works that just completed the entire network of trails and overlooks. So now the, uh, you could do a full loop along the cliff walk, come up uh, through the southeast end of cliffside. There's a new staircase there that leads you up to a trail system that's just along the top of the knoll battery knoll and it winds back down to that existing set of wooden steps that leads back down towards the lighthouse and uh, along that set of trails are three overlooks that sort of have different characters each of them one's for picnicking uh, one has a, a couple granite blocks for overlooking the, the lighthouse itself and one is uh, sort of in the woodsy area to the north which is sort of under the shade of a big oak tree and also has a sort of a peekaboo view of the lighthouse so that has been getting a lot of use and it's also provided us greater access to the site to continue the restoration work. So now that that work has been completed, there's no additional uh, major site work on this project. There's no more need for excavating heavy equipment. Uh, the only kind of equipment that will be continued to use, ideally, would be once each spring for the next few years, um, a Kubota tractor with a mower chipper, um, which was used this past May, and would be once annually each May to uh, basically cut and chip on site dense areas of honeysuckle and bittersweet. Otherwise, uh, th the rest of the four years we have phased out on the budget, which I think you have a copy of the budget. Uh, that is a combination of educational features such as interpretive signage and plant labels and the um, application of herbicides and mowing. 
Uh, most of the other work is just staff and volunteers doing cutting and seed collecting activities. Uh, so I wanted to <clears throat> basically get your full approval for the ongoing work just to continue what we've been doing with the understanding that our partnership with the park committee, uh, each month we, we submit a report to them on our progress and we basically would check in annually with the money we have in the bank that we've been able to raise for the project and basically adjust our scope of effort each year according to how much money we've raised so we would not sort of begin work that we couldn't complete that we know you know, dig, digging projects that we, we would leave like a gaping hole in the site because we ran out of money. And also the understanding is that this is fully funded by the foundation and does not uh, require any funding by the town. So my hope is that I could show you some site photos. Yep. Thank you. So here's, of course, initially the site, uh, if you're probably familiar with, about the cliff walk, which is you know, heavily vegetated pretty wild, um, but mostly dominated by invasive plants such as honeysuckle, bittersweet, and black swallowwort. Uh, these are some of the new trails that have been completed, and they really do offer a really interesting way to explore the landscape um, in addition to the cliff walk. People seem to really enjoy the more intimate way to explore the site. These are some of the areas that connect to existing trails. Uh, you can see the stairs on the lower right there is sort of the southeast edge of cliffside and along the cliff walk. And uh, upper left is the top of the wooden steps where we added a couple granite steps to help improve that landing. And then upper right is where there's that spur trail from the cliff walk that connects to the knoll. That was improved, narrowed, and drainage sort of uh, gradient improved to improve drainage. Right now there's a lot of erosion along there. So some of the work we did was actually to improve existing trail work. This is DeHart Overlook, named after the nearby battery. You can see the uh, really cool granite block there that was split in the lower right. That was actually donated in kind from Phineas Sprague Jr. from a, a pier uh, down in the Four River in Portland. And uh, we handpicked that out and the contractor split it on site. So that's just a little overlook along the south portion of the trail. This is so-called Sullivan Picnic Overlook, which is a uh, an existing picnic overlook uh, that was more hidden, and it will be again once the site is revegetated, but uh, it's sort of central to the knoll and has these commanding views of the whole bay lighthouse to Cushing Island. And same with the heart overlook, you can see the stones that were used to kind of create a sense of space and also to prevent erosion and stabilize the site. This is the area we call Oak Dell. There's a magnificent red oak tree there and it's a very shady area where the temperature drops significantly. We uh, repurposed some existing granite blocks that were just on the site, like rubble, and repositioned them for retaining and also for a place to sit. And here's the budget. The key uh, thing to note is that the ongoing work is what we've phased out over the next four years. Um, all the site work being completed, we have no remaining expenses to incur there. And you can see our, in, our exact, we have available cash balance of 1,643, which is just a little more than enough to complete the interpretive signage that we're working on right now. So we expect to have a 24 by 36 panel out along the cliff walk that explains the entire site. It's got an illustration by Jada Fitch, and it describes the problems we're trying to solve with this work and why it's ongoing and what people can expect to come. And so now it's our job to continue to raise money throughout the next you know, throughout the fall and winter so we can resume work next spring. So at this, at this point, I uh, just like any questions for you both. I, I've got a couple. I'll, I'll go ahead and start unless anyone else is ready to jump in. Um, so, just so I'm clear, um, uh, this was, this isn't, you just gave us an update. This is in our, our agenda of phase four. Phase four, I'm sorry, phase four of the so-called Arboretum Project. Mm -hmm. Phase one being cliffside above Ship Cove that we did in 2012. Uh, phase two meaning lighthouse view. Um, phase three, the children's garden, and this being the fourth site. Um, if you look at the map, which I think I submitted, but I don't have here on my slideshow, yes, you um, you'll see how they're numbered, mm -hmm. of, uh, okay. completed in progress. So this one is the site there along the cliff walk that's considered in progress. Okay, so, okay, thank you. Yep. That's what I meant by I, you phase did four, submit sorry. It. Yep. 
So Cliffside, Lighthouse View, and Children's Garden, those are completed. Yes. Uh, in progress now is Cliff Walk Landscape. Now, uh, that is, um, so we have, a, my understanding is, we have already approved that. You've approved uh, for us to be able to do the work that we could afford last summer. Uh, and what, once the contractor began work this spring on the trails and overlooks, he applied some discounts. We got some in-kind donations, both from he, him and from Phineas Spring Jr., uh, which allowed him to complete the trail. We thought he might have to come back when he could raise more money, but he was really eager to get it done while he was already mobilized, so he's able to give us a discount. We also had some more money come in, so we were able to finish it while he was there. So that's the good news, because for us now, our focus is really just on continuing the restoration. So what, I, what I'm trying to figure out, because the, you know why we uh, voted the way we did last fall, and why we, you know, we, I know you wanted to come back to us and we're trying to schedule for that to happen, and it's happening tonight. What has, so the first three items, Cliffside, Lighthouse, you and Children's Garden, all paid for. Yes. Completed and paid for. Yep. So what exactly now has not been completed, has not been paid for, and what you are seeking approval for tonight? Sure. Uh, the, what remains to be done and paid for in the cliff walk landscape is strictly uh, invasive plant control, which typically we incur those expenses each June and uh, like November. Um, and then as well as any kind of seeding, mulching, erosion control plants that we begin to add once we gain more ground on the invasive plant control. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty much a restoration. Uh, additional monies, small amount towards two interpretive signs and some plant labels once we get to the point along the trail where we want to identify special trees or shrubs. And that's the only money left to be spent. Okay, and so that's all for which you are seeking approval tonight? Yes. Okay, thank you. Great. Yeah, Council Straw. Uh, so um, to sum up then, it, you're seeking approval for uh, what you have marked is number two on your map, which is the cliff walk that you're already doing the work on. You've completed the hardscaping. Over the next three seasons, you're going to continue to remove invasives and plant native shrubs. And what you're seeking is approval for just next year's or all three years? For the entire project with the, uh, all four years actually. Oh, four with years, the understanding sorry. that we would we'll go at that rate. monthly reporting to the park committee and continue to check in with them at least annually on where we're at financially most likely it would be late winter right before work would begin. So they would have an understanding, especially Bob Malley, of what we were able to do in the park and you know, what we can afford to do. And uh, the thing about this work is it's not an all or nothing. Yeah, um, exactly. If we come to a place where we just haven't raised enough money for what we put in that budget, that particular season, we just scale back. Um, we use staff and volunteers, even if it's just trying to maintain the existing uh, invasive cover and not let it get any worse. We can do that without money. It, and as you noted, um, the prior aspects of this particular project involved excavation, hardscaping, whatnot. Now it's literally just uh, slow incremental movement through. So if you don't raise the money at any point, you just kind of stop and no one will be able to tell other than this area is nice and this area isn't yet. So, right, yeah. correct, exactly. The site is basically stabilized now yeah. uh, and that's nice. It'll become increasingly so with, the, with any kind of planting and seeding we do. Um, so the, the, this type of approach that we're doing here is very different than all the other projects, which were more traditional landscape projects, where you had a blueprints yeah. and a planting plan, and you came in and you excavated, put all this hardscape together, then planted it out. In this case, we're sort of slowly working with the site's ecology to try to not have massive disruption all at once, to create erosion and all those things. So this is a, a more nuanced approach to which we hope to apply park-wide at our other sites. If we have success here, this is sort of like a blueprint, learning going forward this new approach. Any other questions, Councilor Garvin? So I think to further clarify where I heard your questions going, Chris, is that the entire plan, and for those that are new, newer to the council or newer to this project, the entire plan was approved a number of years ago. And at each iterative step here, it, it was sort of built into the process that there would be appropriate check-ins to make sure that you know, the foundation wasn't getting out over its skis in terms of you know biting off more project than it could handle. And I, I think what, James, if I'm correct in understanding, you're, you're to the point now where you're, you're looking to streamline that a little bit um, with the, the process that's in place with the Fort Williams Park Committee and, and regular reporting and check-ins so that there isn't the 
frequency of coming before us like you're doing right now. Is that correct? Well, not, not exactly. I'm not, okay. I'm not saying we should bypass uh, approvals of future phases when we get, this is, this is just happens to be a multi-year phase. Yeah. So I'm Th That's what I meant, specific to this, this phase. Particular phase. Yeah. But yeah. once we get this behind us, we start planning for another area, let's say by battery keys or something like yeah. that, we would need to come before you again. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Any any other questions? Uh, no. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate the presentation. So I'm just yeah. I just was thinking of how to word it, but um, I'm thinking that it would be a to approve the request of the Fort Wayne's Park Foundation to complete its phase four. Is yeah. that yeah, probably that yeah. Uh, part the, the uh, continued multi-year ecological. Which is phase four. Okay. okay. To continue the multi-year ecological restoration of the Cliff Walk Landscape Project at Fort Wayne's Park, called Phase Four. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Randall, any more discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. Item number 108, Conservation Committee recommendation for the Cliff House Beach Interim Management. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak to this item? It, yeah. Chairman? Uh, I would just note I live right down the street from the beach, as I mentioned okay. last time it came up. All right, thank you, Councilor Straw. Your name and address and affiliation, if any. Great. Um, Jeremy Gabrielson, I live at Rocky Knoll Road, um, <laughs> and um, I'm the chair of the Conservation Committee. Um, and I just wanted to come uh, give you a, a brief update on the recommendation that we've arrived at. So um, council referred uh, a number of months ago to us a group of neighbors who were having some issues with inappropriate use on the beach. Um, this was came up around the same time as the decision to replace the stairs, which I believe is happening imminently if it hasn't happened already. Um, and um, neighbors raised a number of concerns, uh, mostly around dogs, but also some other inappropriate use on the beach. Um, so the conservation committee had a process with, with the neighbors where we tried to identify some measures that we could take in the short term to address their concerns. Um, I would basically lump the concerns into two groups. Um, there were a set of concerns around parking, um, which we determined were beyond the purview of what the Conservation Committee could be looking at. Um, and then um, issues related specifically to dogs. As you know, there is some confusion around the language in our current dog ordinance, which is another item that the Conservation Committee has on our agenda. So what we um, decided to do as a committee was take an interim step um, this year of placing some signage um, at the head of the stairs requesting that users of the beach be respectful, um, obey applicable ordinances, and then with the understanding that as the fall comes around we will be looking more broadly at the dog ordinance and what exactly we, is meant by groomed areas in the ordinance, um, which is what it refers to now, although it's not defined in the ordinance. Um, and that would give us some opportunity to revisit use of the beach as it relates to off-leash dogs at that time. Um, and also give us an opportunity to check back in with the neighbors once we've had the season behind us, see how the signage is working, um, and make some other recommendations for um, possible changes that might be needed to make this a more pleasant situation for everyone involved. So. Great, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Good evening, my, my name is Tom Myers. I'm at 4 Seaview. Um, I wanted to thank the manager, the town planner, and the conservation committee for their interest and initiative um, in regards to Cliff House Beach, and especially for the opportunity that um, they gave us, the neighbors, for recommendations concerning some interim management steps for this summer. Um, it's a very small town-owned property. I appreciate Jeremy's comments uh, in advance, giving you a little bit of a background of what we were doing. This is really the first time we've had an opportunity to present to you 
Um, and I wish I had more time. Many of our um, movers and shakers on this are either at work or traveling right of town. Um, and I'll just uh, try to summarize um, not so much what's already in your package because it's rather complete, but rather just mention that, um, you know, we sent out a survey to over 500 people from the community. We received over 67 responses from 20 different streets. It doesn't just reflect the comments of the folks that live in the immediate proximate area of the beach, but rather the entire community of users. Um, I'll, I'll sort of cut to the chase because of the time constraint, but you know, on the June 12th meeting that um, Jeremy mentioned, and specifically what you're considering the recommendations for tonight is the sign. And as a reminder, um, the, in the package you may have seen the survey results and prioritization process that we used. And the highest priority for the interim management rule for the summer was a sign that specified rules for dogs, for keeping the beach clean, and for starting fires. And the latter was um, after further discussion with the um, Conservation Committee, we deemed that not appropriate. We didn't want to put that on the sign. The second highest priority, and really overwhelmingly so, was an interim rule for this summer to essentially limit the beach to humans only uh, during certain times of the day, with times in the morning and possibly evening for dogs to be off leash on the beach. And again, dogs interfering with people's enjoyment on the beach is far and away the number one concern that we heard universally from all respondents, regardless of where they were from. I, I couldn't overstate, and I won't really read you all the gross comments that people sent us about what actually happens, but I can tell you fervently that people believe this situation has really gotten out of hand and it is a number one priority. Um, especially if you couple it with the very small size of the beach and the, and the open space that we have down there. The Conservation Committee seemed favorably disposed to recommend an interim management rule restricting dogs at certain times of day, but they um, didn't want to run afoul of the police department's advice concerning their enforcement or inability to enforce an interim rule that was in conflict with a current town ordinance. They opted to propose the softer language that Jeremy mentioned, um, encouraging the people to um, take the ordinance and, and then encouraging us to bring the ordinance change to you, which we'll do in the future. In spite of our community members and the Conservation Committee's best efforts to come up with some interim rule for this summer, we, we really didn't offer anything new. Um, uh, on the on the sign, except for of course the sign, we haven't really proposed. Mr. Myers, your yes. time is up. If you could please wrap it up. Okay, sign doesn't make a difference. Um, I'll have someone else read the rest of the statement that from someone who probably would have been here, but I apologize for that. Unless you could give me the um, courtesy of extending the, my remarks as allowed in the ordinance. As is the will of the council to allow another three minutes for this individual. Sure. Councilor Straw. I move to grant an additional three minutes for this speaker. Okay, is there a second? Okay, second. everyone's in favor? Okay. Uh, thank you for your... Uh, I, I just wanted to know my opposition to that, so. Okay, so it's... Thank you, Chairman. It's, uh, I just want to point out, actually I oppose as well, but I don't prevail, so it's four to two. So you may continue for three minutes. Thank you. I appreciate your indulgence on this matter, and I understand that, in my experience, a sign um, can make a difference. A soft sign that encourages um, such positive behavior like ride your bike or walk instead of driving your car is one of those things that, we can, that is useful to help with some, alleviate some of the parking. But respect with the do dogs, in my experience, a, sign, a soft sign just won't work with some people and the language should be stiffened. This, a kinder, gentler approach doesn't work for people who push the envelope if they're not given explicit boundaries. And the town ordinance reads, and with, and I, um, with all due respect for Jeremy, the section 717, dogs to be stained on municipal property, A, any dog within the boundaries of a groomed and or regularly maintained municipal property. I say it again, or, a regularly maintained municipal property, including but not limited to Fort Williams Park, public roads, municipal sidewalks, and athletic fields, will be walked on a leash or a tether at all times. The ordinance describes the locations where the ordinance doesn't apply, and Cliff House Beach is not one of them. So I believe that Cliff House Beach is a beach, is a municipal property that the town maintains. There shouldn't be a debate about that. The town maintains Cliff House Beach. Hence, the ordinance applies. And so I do strongly support a, a sign as soon as possible that is specific, clear, and direct concerning dogs on the beach. The current bullet on the side reads, 
dog should not should be under control. Should is an absolute is not an absolute, and control is a non-definitive wiggle word. It's what you know dog owners use to skirt the control issue by saying their dog is under voice control. You know a concept that humans understand but dogs don't really quite um, get, and especially with the distractions we have on the beach. So that's my su first suggestion is to change the second bullet to read, the town ordinance requires dogs to be on a leash or a tether at all times. I think it also needs to tell where your immediate point of contact, if there's some problems or inappropriate behaviors, not just rego those regarding dogs or dog owners. So the second suggestion I have is to change a second sentence in the paragraph to read, if you observe inappropriate behavior, please contact the Cape Elizabeth Police Department non-emergency number 207-767-3323. And then the suggestion number three is to add a final sentence in the paragraph. To, if you have any suggestions, please let us know. Again, kinder, gentler is okay in some ways, but I think in this case we need some more definitive language. And again, thank you for your, to the staff, the committee, and the council for the opportunity, the extended time. We're very committed to continuing to work through the process, through the staff, the conservation committee, the ordinance committee, the town council, and any other next steps you might have. And we hopefully have this in place in time for maybe next summer. Thank you. Thank you. What, anyone else? Name and address, please, and affiliation. Tom Ward, uh, 611 Shore Road, which is the, the intersection of Mountain View and Sea View and Shore Road. So from my kitchen window, I can look right down <laughs> the beach, see the traffic, and um, I'm not one of the movers and shakers on this <laughs> issue, <laughs> but I have lived at that spot for 42 years. My kids grew up on that beach. Uh, when I used to go swim three or four times a week down there, uh, dogs were a problem. People did have dogs but they had dogs on leashes and restrained them. Uh, I can't remember ever thinking on the, the times I went down there that dogs were an issue. But in the last four or five years, it's become like a dog park. Uh, and even, um, I brought some video along, but I, it's kind of impossible to believe. You're laying, my, do my daughter-in-law was on the beach and uh, a dog came up and poked its nose in her bag. Uh, we have video of a dog taking a frisbee out of the hand of a kid who was not related. <laughs> I mean, it's the people, some people come down with their dogs and have them on a leash and they're fine. But for every person that does that, there's two or three that just come down with their dogs, sit down and let their dog run like it's a dog park. And as, as uh, Tom said, it's a tiny little cove beach. It isn't even a sand beach at high tide. Uh, so uh, it's, to me, it's kind of a no-brainer that we need, at the very least, a sign which tells people that there is a leash law in effect. And I, the sign is down there now, and someone wrote a sign, handwritten sign, that says, pick up after your dog, which to me is the wrong message because it suggests that as long as you pick up after your dog, your dog can run on the beach. I think we do need a stiff sign. We need a sign, at least now, that reflects the current ordinance. And then we ought to talk about the possibility of more restrictions than that. I, as someone who's been there for a long time, I wouldn't mind sharing the beach with dogs who stayed on a leash and were their owners and were under control. It's the, it's the free running dog park aspect of this that is very hard for people who've lived there for years and used that beach to adjust to. So I would hope at least that you would consider a sign that reflects the current ordinance and uh, then look at what we can do in terms of what other communities have done time-wise to keep dogs off the beach during peak hours. So thank you for your indulgence. Thank you. Anyone else? Name, name and address, please. Sure. And Hi. I'm John Holdridge. I live at 2 Glen Avenue. So I'm on the horseshoe um, that uh, has Cliff House Beach at its, at its zenith, perhaps. 
Um, Excuse me, could you? I, I've lived there for five years. Could you say your last name Holdridge. and address? Hol yep. John Holdridge. Holdridge. H -O -L -D -R -I -D -G -E. Thank you. So I've lived there for five years. Uh, five years, I'm the new guy in the neighborhood. My kids uh, are growing up on that beach now. Um, I've lived there long enough to know that there has been a change in the number of people that are using the beach. I've been there long enough to be involved with the survey and to, to note a little bit of concern. Um, my concern has been that, that perhaps we become the place when, when um, the South Portland Beach um, changes its dog laws in the summertime that everybody now comes to Cliff House Beach. Um, I was on the beach the other day and there were five people with dogs and there was not a single problem. Um, I'm not advocating for absolute control of dogs or, or uncontrol of dogs. I'm, I think we could, should continue to work on this. Some people might say that for every well-behaved dog, there's two or three that are misbehaved. Um, I would say maybe for every misbehaved person with a dog, there are five or six who are perfectly behaved. And so I just want to make sure that that we're looking at both sides. Um, I also have been, you know, offended by some people's behaviors. I've heard about a video in the neighborhood of a dog on the 4th of July stealing a Frisbee from a child's hand. Um, that doesn't always happen. And I think that's the rare occasion that that happens. So I really am speaking, I think, only to say that it's easy to capture the videos and the comments about bad behavior of too many people or too many dogs or misbehaved people or misbehaved children or misbehaved this and that. It's easy to capture those things. That's what we focus on. Um, I was there the other day and I had the beach all to myself for three hours in the morning. A bunch of people showed up, you know, by 12 noon, by one. There was maybe 30 people and I decided it was time to go home. But you know, those people were all having fun and I was done with my fun and decided I'd just go home to my backyard. So I hope that we'll just continue to look at this. I, I like uh, and appreciate the Conservations Committee. I like and appreciate the soft approach. It is, again, an interim approach for the summer. Um, nobody really likes being told what to do. Um, I, I like suggestions of good behavior. Um, and that's that, thanks. Thank you. And we are at 15 minutes, I believe, of public comment, so I, I'm not going to ask for any more unless the council would like me to. Okay. Councilor Lennon? Um, I, I'm just really confused why there's dogs on this beach. Every other beach in the area just bans dogs from March to November, or whatever it is, April. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually surprised. And I've heard that um, the reason there's so many dogs on that beach now is you, on the internet, it says to people, if you Google, where can I have fun outdoors in the greater Portland area with my dog, the, that comes up as you know one of your top 10 hits. So once again, this is not necessarily Cape residents using Cape Elizabeth property. So um, I know we're rewriting the ordinance, but I, I guess this brings up the issue, should we treat beaches somewhat differently than a grassy area? To me, it's a sanitary issue. I mean, it, usually when you're walking in grass, you have shoes on and clothes on. You've got little kids on a beach with a bathing suit and nothing else. I mean, they're walking around in bare feet, stepping in dog waste, and then tromping into the ocean. It's just like, I'm just shocked we have dogs there. Sorry, I mean, I, maybe I'm being controversial. I don't know the backstory on this, but is that it's, it could be the only beach now in the area that actually allows dogs in the summer, so I'm perplexed. I, thank you, Council Lennon. I'd like to just confirm in our package that what I'm looking at uh, is, act, is what the Conservation Committee is recommending, and that is, it's a, uh, I've got it on my computer, Town of Cape Elizabeth, Cliff House Beach, Attention Beach Users. It's a small beach and so forth. Yes. That's, that's actually what you are recommending. I just want to be clear about that. Because I think, I think Council Lennon has an excellent point, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody's looking at the same thing I'm looking at. <laughs> because that might be a place to tweak. But anyhow, Council Jordan? Oh, I was gonna say, I, I was you know, reading our ordinance and that's why we're rewriting it. We really can't do much more than this right now until the, or until the dog ordinance is rewritten. And if you want to rewrite it to ban dogs 
on beaches, and that's what we need to write into it. But right now, dogs are allowed on Cape Elizabeth beaches. That's what the ordinance says. So unfortunately, you can't just make new rules. I'm not saying that we can't and make them into ordinance, but we can't just make new rules that aren't ordinances. We can't just decide to change it just because, you know, today we're, we've got to go through the process. So if we're going to change it, then we've got to go through the process. But this is what we can do, is we can ask that they should, you know, be under control. And, and I don't even know, you know, if you can require that much, but you can put a, you know, please, or, you know, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'd like the town manager has something to add, and then Council Straw. Just to, yeah, the, the, the concern is well, with the chief, if you read through the memo yeah. you saw where Chief Williams said that. can't enforce identified. anything beyond. Yeah, the, the question that comes down to in the gray area is maintained. You know, does the town maintain, it's maintained or groomed. Now, there's two ways to look at that. This summer, the town is spending a pretty good amount of money on replacing the stairs that go to the beach. Aren't we maintaining the beach, in a sense? I mean, aren't we maintaining the property in its, in its own? So, I mean, the chief is out today, he'll be back tomorrow, but there's some, you know, there's some wiggle room there mm -hmm. as far as, you know, uh, an outright ban would not work within the ordinance, but the leash law, in effect, could work within the ordinance if you say, you need to be on a leash because the town does maintain the beach as we're, we're putting a pretty serious capital investment into the property. And that may be the middle ground for this year to do. Uh, the, it comes down to enforcement also. Uh, oftentimes, you know, with an animal control issue, by the time the call is made and the ACO arrives, there, the dog's gone and, you know, at, at home at that point in time. That being said, that doesn't mean we don't enforce the rules uh, just because we can't get there in time. So, but I think if you put that up there and said, you know, and after talking with the chief, you could say the town does maintain it and our intent is to say this is, you know, although it doesn't specify it, it also doesn't specify it as an off-leash area where there are areas that are specifically are designated within the ordinance. So that may be, at least for this time, until more explicit language can be developed that you can say, you know, the town is really maintaining the beach and a leash law should be in effect here. And just that that's the gray area that could provide a little less gray, I guess, and a little more black and white. Councilor Straw? So um, I have a little experience with this, having <laughs> been on the Fort Williams Park Commission where we, basically this exact same discussion happened before. The issue that we ran into is the dog ordinance. First off, um, the sign I would change should to shall. We can say shall be under control. Control encompasses voice control. And even if you're not on leash, on municipal grounds, they still have to be under voice control. So I would wipe out, I would replace should with shall. Um, I think we can very easily do that. Um, the groomed argument, it kind of went to the question of, oh, well, what about the Gullcrest trails? Are those groomed because we groom them f with snowmobiles or uh, cross country trails in the winter time? Uh, it's a little bit of a stretch. And if you have an ordinance where you're basically going to be fining someone or saying they've broken an ordinance, um, we're gonna, it seems like we might be hard pressed if we have a vague ordinance to try to enforce it against someone and be making that argument. I personally don't think it's fair uh, to be doing that. Um, and frankly, until these stairs were recently dealt with, uh, I don't think the town has done any grooming of that beach or the stairs in years. They were uh, outside of when there was the big storm a decade or two ago. Other than that, they've basically just sat there. And neighbors in the community have been the ones that have been mowing the lawn and cleaning the grass. So it is a stretch for me to call that groomed. Um, so I think we would be hard pressed. I definitely think we're already looking at this, uh, revising the dog ordinance. This definitely should be encompassed in that. Um, I completely agree with uh, Councillor Jordan that this is probably, and uh, Councillor Lennon, that what we're seeing is uh, as the dogs are pushed off of Willard, they've migrated down here. Um, I would note, and I, I'm willing to bet the Conservation Committee has not looked at this yet, uh, there is another beach right north of us at the end of Drew Road. It has a private beach sign, but your peer group in South Portland back in the 80s wrote a report that said, this is odd, they have this, this is a private beach sign, but it appears there's a public right of way that goes down and encompasses the beach. 
Uh, no one has ever pursued that to my knowledge. And if we're experiencing traffic coming in from South Portland when there's this beach that it would be interesting to see if South Portland pursued that, it turns out that's actually a public beach that this group has walled off for the last few decades. I, I'd be curious to see what came out from that. Um, so whether the town manager pursues that, whether the conservation committee pursues that, it would be interesting to see if South Portland ever reached a decision on what's going on with the beach at the end of Drew. Is that a public beach that these groups from South Portland perhaps could migrate over into that location. Um, so I'd encourage someone to look into that to the extent we can and see if South Portland has a official opinion on the beach. Thank you. Any, anyone else? Could, uh, Councilor Jordan, I, you know, I was wondering, and this, this could be what, one of the things, and I'm just forgetting in the moment that the police chief was concerned about. Do you think on this sign we could say dogs should be leashed? Where, was that something the police chief wasn't thinking he could handle? And I just don't remember how that. The enforcement. He can't the enforcement. Enforce you, can, you can ask. You could put uh, the word that okay. we request that you kindly leash your dogs or something. But he can't, with what we're okay. saying That's, in this gray area, yep. he will not, it won't withstand the straight face test. If he tries to find somebody or enforce it, they could turn around, take him to court, and say, "There's no way this is passing muster." But, but we could, we could request. Request. We request that dogs, all dogs, be leashed. Right. We could do that, which I yep. would like, frankly, mm -hmm. to do. I think I agree with Councillor um, Lennon. Uh, you know, this. I was on that beach as a kid. This is a tiny beach, and I, I frankly see this as a public health issue. I mean, I, I, I you mean, know. I, and I, and I think that you know the money that we're spending today absolutely <laughs> qualifies for maintaining that beach. Whether it did the past or not, that's the past. This is the present. There. You know, so that's what I'm thinking. I, I would be very interested in in changing this to read do, uh, I don't know how we would do that. Uh, the language to request that dogs be all dogs be leashed. Mm -hmm. um, we I don't know how we do that. Perhaps if, dogs should be under control by leash. Yeah, by leash. Because you know, I when we get into the dog thing later on, I have a I've always had dogs, I've trained dogs, and I have a lot to say about voice control. <laughs> uh, Council Lennon? So I just have a suggestion. It, it sounds like right now we're not gonna solve this whole issue. So right. I think we should just vote on tweak. this with maybe a tweak saying instead of should say shall or or so, uh, some soft with language. the leash, we could if we can for ask for just, leashing. You know, I, I mean, I, I agree with John. Just just appeal to people's better selves. I personally think a lot of people won't follow it, but whatever. Have that be an interim thing, and then like I think when, as the ordinance committee looks at these dog issues, mm -hmm. I think we need to take a hard look mm -hmm. and maybe break things out into places rather than one blanket. I mean, what's appropriate on a wooded trail. I think is is different than a playing field. Is different than um, you know the Fort Williams roadway. Is different than a beach. I mean, it just is. I don't think the dogs should be on beaches when people are there during the six months of summer. That's my personal opinion. So, I think for right now this is good. I really appreciate all the work they've done, but I think that we need a more definitive solution. What would long term? Thank you. Would would counselors be willing to change the language? Dogs should be under control by leash. Is that is for an interim that could still? Let's just say dogs should be leashed. Well, we re we have to put in a form of request. I mean, would that kindly pass? leash your kindly, dog? Kindly leash your dog or something. Well, I, Jordan? I was going to suggest at the end of this sentence at the beginning it says to that end. We could just put to that end the town Cape Elizabeth requests, and then you have those five requests. And we're to that end the town town people is a request and then dogs should be under con, should right, be leashed. I mean you can't require people to be considerate of all users either, but you can request them to be. <laughs> you can't require them to walk or bike to the beach, but we can request them to. So that's what I'm saying it will just encompass all of it. And then dogs so, should be under control and it's either you've got your dog under control through leash leash or you know voice. So I'll ask the town manager to read his interpretation of what this tweak, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, I mean, you may want to say to that end, dogs shall be under control by leash, or or or, or, or dogs shall be leashed. 
to I, that, the town of Cape Elizabeth's request. I mean, it's request right. I was versus just adding to that end the town of Cape Elizabeth requests, and then then your your semicolon comes, and then you have your five requests. Yep, and then just alter it instead of dogs should be under control. Be dogs shall shall be leashed. That's up for debate, I think. Uh, I'm making the one suggestion at the beginning, and then those five requests as written. As written okay. currently, okay. Well, I, I'm interested in adding. Right, so that's what I'm saying. We've got two different tweaks. Well, is that, well okay, has everybody agreed with the town of Cape Elizabeth's request to that end? Okay. Yes. I mean, so. once it's a request, it's no longer a demand. And if you say dog shall be leashed, it's still under the request. Someone could technically blow it up. But honestly, if you say under control, that means absolutely nothing. nothing. That is a joke. It means absolutely nothing anyhow, sorry. <laughs> but leash is not up to interpretation. I mean, people are like, oh, my dog's under control. I'm like, But really? it's still it's, a request it's like, for a leash. Right, I get it, so it's not binding, but it's a little more specific. Put your dog on a leash. Through the chair, please, so Sorry. we don't waste time. Councilor Strauss next, and then Councilor Randall. Uh, so with uh, the modification proposed by uh, Councilwoman uh, Jordan, if we then strike that line that says dogs should be under control and then instead put dogs be uh, leashed between the hours of 9 a.m. to whatever and change that That's for what the dog line is. Better. Councilor George, uh, Councilor or Randall. bands no, completely. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Councilor Randall. Uh, I I just think if we start putting in things like dogs should be leashed, something more like these are all very much in the form of suggestions. If we put in something like that, we may be inviting conflict among beach users as to what this means, and that it may make the most sense to approve this recommendation for now and really get to work on addressing the dog ordinances town-wide because it seems like that is something that urgently needs to be addressed. I, I think that's a great suggestion, but I, I don't think leash is, a leash is a leash. So I, I don't know, you're, you're saying the conflict would be if someone is not a leash, someone else is saying you're supposed to be leashed? Your dog, okay. Right. Kelsey Garvin is next, I believe. No, I. I, I I guess just generally, I, um, regardless of the leash comment, I agree with the sense of, um, I appreciate the approach that both the committee took as well as all the comments from the folks in the neighborhood that um, so often when we have an issue come before us, it's, well, let's get to the ultimate solution as quickly as possible. And I appreciate the sort of um, gradual and iterative approach that both the committee and the, the neighborhood has taken here, understanding that um, there's some things that need to be worked out and we can't sort of solve all the, all the problems associated with the all at once. So um, this is the first of what I expect will be multiple steps on this. And so I don't, I don't know that we need to sort of, you know, don't, don't let progress, perfection be the enemy of progress on this. So if, if this is better than what's there today, let's go with this and we can keep working at it. So. All right. Councilor Jordan. I just want to, I mean, Councilor Straw had a great suggestion with the, the leash part with I mean, if you read through it, they, they are suggesting that we have the 9 to whatever time. I didn't look. Sorry. Is it 5? I can't remember. From 9 a.m. to a certain time during the certain times of the year. If we're going to make the request, we might as well, we could make the request to that specificity. And then either you're a good neighbor coming to the neighborhood beach or you're not. And people know that it's not enforceable, but basically everybody's like, Sweet, so you aren't that nice of a person to <laughs> ask to follow the requests, you know, that the neighborhood's asked you to, to follow. I mean, that's basically what it comes down to. You might as well throw it on there while you're making the sign and, and put it out there. It's got a little more meat to it. It's still the same request, but at least it has, it's a, it's a kind of win-win. People want to have their dogs off leash. They can go down before 9 a.m. People want to come after 9 a.m., then we're requesting that they put their dog on a leash. It, it to me, seems like a, a good solution as we're moving forward to a ultimate solution. So you, you would add time frames onto the, the sign? Right. Okay. Councilor Garvin, did you have another comment? I, I was just going to I think that the time frames add a degree of specificity and material change for use that, um, you know, probably people that you know, we've heard from neighbors that are of a certain position on this. I haven't heard anybody come up here that's a dog owner, dog user, or anything like that. And I, I think that that degree of material use change probably, um, I'd like to see further 
public notice and public scrutiny of that before making something like that on the fly tonight, so. All right, thank you. So it looks like right now where we are is the only change that everybody seems to agree upon is uh, Councilor Jordan's uh, addition of to that end the town of Cape Elizabeth requests. Am I correct on that? That's where everybody is right now? You don't want to change anything else other than that? Okay. Let's move the question. Is there a motion? So we're, we're leaving the dog line as is? Uh, is apparently. That what, that, if that, okay. We're leaving it as is. I mean, that seems to be everyone's, the, the consensus, unless I'm reading it wrong. Council Lennon? I move that we um, accept the Conservation Committee's recommendation um, uh, around signage at Cliff House Beach for an interim, interim management step. With the addition of the words? With the addition of the words, um, the town of Cape Elizabeth requests. requests. Okay, great. In the introduction. Thank you. Is there a second? Councilor Jordan? Mm -hmm. Any more comment? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Yeah, great, thank you. Yeah. Chairwoman? And just to be clear, the ordinance committee is currently reviewing the dog ordinance and this issue will be encompassed in the overall review or do mm -hmm. we need to specifically send this to the ordinance committee? Uh, let me ask the town manager to address it. If I may, through the chair. Uh, the conservation committee, is it's on their agenda. They'll be, they'll be working on it. They were charged with that this, this spring by the council. And, and I believe at that point, well, go ahead, right. Councilor well, Jordan. In their memo to us, we sent it to conservation. They say they're not going to get to it till the fall. Then it will come back to the town council, and the town council will most likely then send it to ordinance. So it's looking like January, February. <laughs> before there's any new ordinance in realistic time frame? Well, in the interest of democracy, it takes time sometimes. <laughs> no, and but. If I, if, I, if I may through the chair. Yes. Uh, the Conservation Committee has done a considerable amount of work with, with the dog community in Cape Elizabeth uh, historically and have, uh, because they do work with a lot of the town properties, so they have that dialogue already established with a lot of the dog community. So I think in many ways they've got a lot of the work already They've, they've covered a lot of that territory already in, under discussion, so when they do take it up, it's not a, there's not a steep learning curve to learn where they need to be. And so I, I think they're prepared to come forward. So I, uh, I, I appreciate, I, I appreciate <laughs> Council Jordan's uh, uh, <laughs> remarks, but I do think it'll, it'll happen. You know, as Mr. Meyer said, you will probably see a lot of things in place for the, for the next you know, warm season, if you will. Oh, yeah, I totally agree. I but it'll, it'll, it'll be late fall, early winter. All I don't right. disagree. But, but that's the reason why it was at, it was at conservation at, at this point. So just to be clear, though, to, and to rephrase my question then, uh, so the conservation committee will, is now going to be looking at this issue without us having to refer it specifically to them. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So it is teed up. We already did. Uh, yeah. uh, but that was dogs in general. I just want to make sure this issue in particular will be encompassed. Yeah, all, yep. Yep, all, right. all part and parcel. All right. yep. Okay, moving on. The next item is uh, not one item number 109, 14 Strout Road Tower Overlay District Map Amendment. Um, would anyone from the public like to comment on this item? I do see someone from the public coming. <laughs> okay, so this item was originally... Your, your name, address, oh, and affiliation, please. Uh, my <laughs> name is Joe Shalott. I'm the vice chair of the planning board. I'm here. Um, the chair uh, recused herself from the uh, proceeding on this issue. Um, the town council referred to the planning board um, a request from Tower Specialists, Inc., uh, represented by Justin Strout, to reduce the size of the tower overlay district on their, uh, on a large piece of property. Um, they did this in order to uh, facilitate some estate planning and uh, contemplation of subdivision of the land. Um, if you think of the lot as a large rectangle, it's kind of volcano-shaped, 
and the existing portion that has the towers is up near the top, which makes sense because that has the greatest range for uh, uh, use in the community. And so the request was to take a portion of the lot out of the tower overlay district. And we worked with Justin um, on a couple of workshops and then a final meeting to uh, um, come up with this, what I think is a very simple solution. Uh, I think you've all, you've all seen this. And uh, what's important to note is it's a two-phased process. The, um, the uh, district is big enough at the moment to accommodate uh, the two towers that are on, a, on the site and a future tower, and uh, the size of the overlay district would be further reduced in the future when, the, uh, when one of the towers comes down. The size of the overlay district is required uh, due to the, uh, what's called the fall zone, in case the tower falls over. It's fairly obvious. And um, yeah, that's it. I've got a question. Did you say that it curr it, it's currently sized for the two towers and an additional one? Uh, maybe I misunderstood. Yeah, so okay. there's a, we had a, um, we permitted an additional tower up towards the top, and there's an existing second tower which is owned by Crown, uh, and that's a little further down the hill, and that we proved uh, to have that one taken down. And um, when it is taken down at that point, the, uh, the, the zone will contract and get smaller. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have any questions of, for Joe? Um, and he is, the three minutes are up, but uh, he, he's here representing the planning board, so. At this point, unless there's any objection, I, I think we could, if anyone would like to ask a question, they could. Sure. Council Straw. Uh, so the one thing I've been trying to wrap my head around with this was why would anyone want to shrink this zone? And we've heard it's for estate planning purposes and whatnot. Um, it, easier to subdivide the land. Uh, but even in that case, you're still going to have this massive tower in your background. So that, I'll take it at face value, but it still makes me scratch my head, so I'll just put my cards on the table. Um, are we somehow in any way being used in a way to influence the other tower issues that are in front of the planning board? That's what I want to know. I don't think so. I right. mean, I think we asked Justin that same question, and um, I mean, the land at the lower elevations is of dubious value. You can see some of its wetland and some of its, a lot of it, especially at the back, is low elevation and not really conducive to towers. So, and so I mean, what the argument Justin presented was that um, if you're going to sell land for uh, single-family homes, they don't want people generally don't want to be in a tower overlay district. Now, yes, you're looking at a big tower, but that's a given. So beyond that, though, this seemed like a reasonable change to you and not driven by anything else? I mean, I, I'm willing to take it at face value, yes. but I do scratch my head. It's, we it's, had a lot of discussion. Yeah. Okay. With the planning, and yes, it seemed like it seemed quite reasonable, and Justin was very reasonable in give and take of the size of and shape of the zone that would end up being. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so the planning board uh, has made this recommendation. Uh, the town planner is here. Would the council like the town planner to address the item? No? no? Okay. Uh, is there a motion? And then we can get into discussion. So 
Does this not need to be referred to a public hearing? I thought that was the recommended action. Oh, yes. I? Yep, that's, yeah. that's what you'd have to did send it for a public hearing. Oh, a, yeah, there it is. Yep. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> it's it's there we go. <laughs> All right, yes, a motion, please. I move that we refer this item to a public hearing. And a second. Councilor Lennon? Any discussion? <laughs> All those in favor? Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll schedule that for August August 13th. Yep. Sounds good. Perfect. Do you want me to, to walk you guys through anything? I don't think we need that at this point. Okay. Any questions? Did anybody want to ask? I, I don't have... Does this, anyone have this any? This is Justin, Justin Strout. Okay. <laughs> this is Justin Strout. We need to... I'm sorry. You know, we would need you to come to the podium. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, anyway, we now, we all know who you are now, anyway. <laughs> does, does anyone have any questions for Mr. Stroud? No, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm sure we'll see you at the public hearing. All right. Okay, item number 110, and uh, collective bargaining agreement with the Cape Elizabeth Benevolent Association. Is there anyone who would like to speak to this item? All right, seeing no one, I will actually ask the town manager to introduce this item. Thank you, Madam Chairman. This is uh, the first of two items in a row that is uh, related to collective bargaining agreements for the town. Uh, early this early this year, the, the town, um, myself, Bob, uh, sorry, and uh, Chief Williams, and uh, we were assisted by Linda McGill from Bernstein Shore, uh, entered into discussions with the Policeman's Benevolent Association uh, regarding the renewal of their contract, which would start this year, and it's, uh, we're looking at a three-year contract, and the terms are all uh, contained within the, the document that we do have, but it was, a, it was a very positive negotiation that was concluded, and they, the union has voted to uh, accept this and I do have a signed copy of the agreement upstairs on my desk so uh, they are ready to, to go forward with this but it, it was a, you know one of the desires that we did have was that it was going to be a three-year term and uh, we accomplished that as well as uh, as well as economic uh, certainty for the next three years for the town okay and just for the audience at home that the town council did have an executive session on um, the details of this agreement so is there a motion to approve uh, the three-year collective bargaining agreement between the Town of Cape Elizabeth and the Cape Elizabeth Police Benevolent Association for term July 1, 2018 to June 30, 2021 as presented? So moved. Councilor Straw, a second. Councilor Randall, any further discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Item number 111, collective bargaining agreement, Teamsters Local Union number 340. Is there anyone who would like to speak to that item? No, seeing no one, and I will ask the town manager to introduce this item. I will also say that the town council reviewed this agreement in detail in executive session. So. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Again, this is a, a similar theme to be struck with this item on the agenda as well. Uh, I want to th thank Bob Malley as well as Linda McGill once again from Bernstein Shore. And we started roughly within a week of the other negotiations, so it's been a fairly busy spring uh, trying to negotiate both collective bargaining agreements. Uh, this also was approved by the union uh, a short time ago. And uh, this, again, provides the town with economic certainty for the next three years as well as uh, provides us some stability for folks at the union level as well. So. Uh, this is a good fair contract, I think, and both sides are, should, be, should walk away from this quite pleased, I think. It's fair. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the three-year collective bargaining agreement between the Town of Cape Elizabeth and the Teamsters Local Union Number 340 for term July 1, 2018 to June 30, 2021 as presented? So moved. Councilor Randall, is there a second? Councilor Lennon, any more discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 112, year-end budget shortfalls. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak to this item? Oh, seeing no one, I will ask the town manager to uh, uh, discuss this one. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd, I'd be happy to. Uh, what you have here is an itemized listing of separate accounts that, uh, well, well, let me back up for a moment. Uh, 
the charter provides that no department is permitted to exceed its budget without the council's authorization. Uh, so that's why I brought this forward this uh, this evening, is to get the council's authorization to to in a sense uh, satisfy the the shortfalls in each of those different accounts. And you notice I have them uh, identified. I did receive an email uh, that the whole council was copied on from Councilor Lennon, uh, specifically inquiring about legal and audit and why that one had a significant uh, significant shortfall. Uh, the long answer on that is unanticipated litigation that the town has been entered into over the course of the past year. Uh, specifically on, uh, in, on one area is on the Paper Street issue. Uh, where we have, you know, we have a very good law firm uh, who we've had to employ considerably with Bergen and Parkinson, and that roughly resulted in almost twenty thousand six hundred dollars worth of expenditures this year. That, quite honestly, we didn't I didn't anticipate when we were crafting the budget at this time uh, like a year or so ago. We also had uh, with Bernstein Shore uh, expenditures of almost eleven thousand eight hundred dollars, and that was specifically to. Uh, some personnel issues as well as negotiating on the on the collective bargaining agreements that we had just approved uh, that the council just approved on the prior two articles so those two between the two of them roughly come to about thirty two thousand dollars of the forty eight thousand uh, dollars overage and then the other areas that we did have we had uh, some some planning board and some council areas that we needed some significant legal uh, assistance on we had uh, one case that was remanded back to the town twice uh, regarding uh, a property up on Old Ocean House Road, I'm, I'm uh, sorry, on Ocean House Road. Uh, with the Maxwell Woods de development, there was the Ag Amendment that took a considerable amount of discussion and consultation with the attorneys. And then uh, Astor Lane, uh, which was up earlier this evening, uh, that discussion that at the end of the year, uh, promote, actually starting in about February with the code officer working its way through the planning board level, uh, also contributed a considerable amount of expenditures that we weren't anticipating at the, uh, at, with Monaghan Lakey. So, uh, and then there were other council areas of, of discussion that took place over the year, one, one of which was, the, if you may recall, the conflict of interest question. So that was, that also itself considered, you know, required quite a bit of consultation with the attorneys as well as other council questions. So that really contributed to the lion's share of that was those three firms. Of course, Monaghan Leahy is our primary firm, so you'll see, you know, you, I'd be happy to provide you a listing of all the expenditures, but that was, they are our primary attorney, but on this, these special interest areas is where we really got, had a, a greater level of expenditures. Uh, of note, uh, we did increase this year's legal, legal expense line by $30,000 in anticipation of the case for the Paper Street, uh, Paper Street uh, suit for this coming year, but a good portion of that lifting has already taken place with Bergen and Parkinson through the discovery phase of of the case, uh, where they had to assemble a considerable amount. Of, I think it was a, close to 12,000 12, pages worth of documents uh, to respond to the request for inquiries from from the other side. So uh, now we'll go forward from this point forward. But that budget was built in anticipation of it. This last one did not have that <laughs> anticipation built in. Um, the other areas are, are fairly, the recycling refuse disposal is the other large one as well uh, that we had some personnel issues that took place up, up there over the course of the past year. Uh, they, they required us to have, we required us to use a lot of temporary assistance from outside of the town, which is expensive, and it led to a, a cost overrun that, that was reflected in here as well. Any questions? Council Lennon? Is that recycling situation resolved? Council Lennon, I would like to say yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, we have. Are we, gonna, are we still no, hiring things. temps? We, uh, no, uh, no, we, we are not. We, we have a really good stable situation developing up there uh, as we speak. So, um, yeah, we, we had some, yeah, we had a couple of serious challenges there last year health wise that, that led us down the road, but everybody's healthy and, performing, so yes, I, I think we're in good shape there, Council Lennon. Could I ask about the pool programs? Sure. Uh, pool programs are uh, generally, I, I noticed a trend over the years, this is one that 
tends when the town owns the operations of community services, this has been something that has arrived uh, mm -hmm. in the past. Um, the pool revenues fluctuate a bit up and down, uh, but our expenditures stay uh, the same. So, uh, but we're we're getting closer. I guess would be a way to. I think this so, is our smallest gap we've had when it comes okay. to pool revenues. So this is a this is generally a result of uh, uh, lower revenues that we are kicking in to make the difference. Is that am well, I understanding that correctly? Well, our, our pool programs we had more expenses on that oh. s side of it, but okay. uh, but this year we were yeah we were closer than we have been in the past, but. It's still, it's, I think we're, we're gonna get better as we go. Okay, thank you. A anyone else, any other questions? Uh, is there a motion to approve uh, the uh, additional appropriations as recommended by the town manager? Councilor Garvin? So is there a second? Councilor Lennon? Is there any more discussion on these items? All those in favor? It's unanimous. All right, thank you. Next item is 100, item number 113, the proposed carry forward balances. Uh, is there anyone from the public who would like to speak to this item? All right, seeing no one. Um, you know, we, we usually do have a list every year of carry forward balances once we've ended the fiscal year and we've, we're into a new one. So I'll again, I've got a, one or two I wanted to ask about, but I'll again uh, ask the town manager to introduce this item. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd be happy to. Uh, what we have here is a listing of items uh, that we'd like to carry forward from the current, of the last fiscal year into the current fiscal year. Uh, some of these are areas that were, uh, were planned expenditures that just didn't fully be expended during the course of the year. Uh, of note, the, lar the large one obviously is Hillway and Scott Dyer Road improvements. Uh, that's an on ongoing multi-phase project that we had funds uh, that will be used over the next couple of years. So we may see this show up for the next two budgets uh, as far as, as this project gets completed. Um, there are other areas that just w did not happen this year, uh, like a, from uh, computer replacements at the, at the, at the police department. Uh, some work at community center, uh, rental building repairs. There's some ongoing projects that, you know, due to not even not being able to be scheduled, we we do carry them over to the following uh, following fiscal year, and that's that's why these are are on there. And some of them are planned, uh, like you can see tree tree maintenance that we have in there, or family fun day, uh, for instance. That's just a little one at two thousand five hundred dollars, but. Uh, the tradition has been to carry that forward because they usually, we may have bills that come in after after the year starts, so we we try to catch up with them due to the timing of that of that event. Mr. Jordan, so, I was wondering what the original library building ninety five thousand dollars was. That's ninety five thousand dollars we have to improve the original library building, as it. It's, uh, it's for ongoing, there's uh, some acoustic panels that they need to install in the entry area. Uh, what, is the, what is it referencing as the original library building? Oh, it's the, the, the Thomas Memorial Library. It's oh, just what not it, the Sperling School No, not House. the Sperling School House. Well, that's why I was like, no. <laughs> what does it mean by original library building? You mean yeah. the front half of the The front the half, the, the, the newly improved original library building. But that's uh, yeah, some continued work that needs to take to take place there. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? I just was wondering about the uh, town hall meeting spaces, office spaces plan, and the town hall main stairwell upgrade. Yes, on, on Sim One Five Forty One Eleven. Yep. That is work that uh, we're looking at, and it's been it's been carried forward now for a couple of different years. I think, uh, according to Perry Schwartz. This morning, he identified to Deborah and I that we should be getting some drawings next week. It's some work that is being planned to be done in the in the clerk's office area, okay. in the tax collection area. Uh, that's just taken forever, quite frankly, to, to get to get done. Okay. Uh, due to being able to disrupt our operations in there, mm -hmm. trying to find a weekend or an extended period of time that you can actually not need that area uh, for business is is a challenge. 
And then uh, stairwell repairs, I think that's looking at, at, at work in, in both ends of this. If you notice on the walls, there's some, yeah. there's some water damage that has taken place in there. Uh, that's a consistent maintenance challenge. Okay, thank you. Councilor Jordan? I just have another question. I notice a lot of this is like building painting, building roof and siding, ADA repairs to the church, like public building rec repairs, all, all these repairs. Do we do this all in-house or do we, are these budgeted so that we can hire people? How come all these repairs aren't getting done? How come there's so many carry forward of basic repairs? Some of them, they're in process of being done. We do have some, some of the works done in-house and then some of the work we do con contract out. Uh, it depends upon, uh, on way, like the ADA repairs, we'll probably contract out. And some mm -hmm. of the work that we've had done at the community center, uh, like the front part of the community center, I think was carried forward. Uh, there's some work, uh, rental building repairs there at 715 yeah, that's, yeah. that's one of those. There's some con continuous work that needs to take place on the front of the building okay. and, and other different repairs that come up. So the facilities that asked to carry forward the unexpended funds because still work to do. we'll still find find a use for that fund over the course of the year. They okay. they they they're doing things all along, but they they need to augment it because they run it. A lot of these older buildings run into some challenges. It's kind of like peeling an onion. Sounds good. Any other uh, questions? Is there a motion to approve the carry forward balances to be applied uh, as of July one, two thousand eighteen? Councilor Garvin, is there a second? Councilor Jordan, any more discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. And now we have an opportunity again for citizens to bring any topic to the council that is not on tonight's agenda. Would anyone like to do this? Seeing no one, well, could I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. And a second, please. Councilor Randall, all those in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you.